Before we start the show, I want to thank and recognize our sponsor, Christy McCullough, and her Mobile, Alabama firm, Empowered Family Law, empowering families to navigate difficult changes and create new beginnings. I really think that everything in your life is put there for you to, to grow and to develop you as a person. Like sometimes obstacles that can damage you, if you grow from them, if you learn from them, then, then they make you better. It's about getting up and putting that foot in front of the other each day, every day. I think we're here just to help people stay on the path that they were meant to be on. And life can be tough on the good days. And I think if you can say at the end of the day, Look, you know, I, I helped people today. That's enormous. Hey, everyone. This is Rod Kate, and welcome to this week's episode of Rocket Motivation. When this week's guest was growing up in rural Mississippi, he witnessed abuse of his mother by his father. He went from a fairly affluent childhood to one of poverty, sometimes not knowing where his next meal was coming from or if it was coming at all. He put himself through Florida State University and eventually law school at Mississippi College. He came to Mobile in 2005, initially struggled as a new lawyer, and now has a very successful criminal defense practice. He's also one of my closest friends. Jason Darley, welcome to Rocket Motivation. Thank you, Rod, for having me. All right. So, Jason, let's start by doing this. Tell us where you are now in your life, your family, where you live, your career, and you can leave out how much my friendship means to you. <laughs> okay. I live in the Mobile, Alabama area. Uh, I practice here solely focused on the defense of people charged with crimes. I have a heavily uh, federal-leaning practice as well as I do capital litigation where people are facing the death penalty oftentimes. Uh, I'm married. I have two kids, and uh, we are uh, happily in this area. All right. All right. Now, let's go back. Take us back to your childhood. Tell us, you know, where you grew up, and tell us, you know, what happened that changed your life around? Well, I don't make excuses or I don't lament anything that I've ever been through. I, I, I believe that everything we go through happens for a reason. It helps mold us, and it helps shape us, Rod. Uh, you know, I was born in Georgia, and shortly after, my, my father, who worked in the automotive industry, he got transferred to Mississippi uh, with his job, and we lived there for about 12 years. And uh, they were overall great years, you know, but uh, as you mentioned, the relationship soured uh, between he and my mother. You know, my dad was a great man. He was a hard man at times. Uh, you know, we learned later on in life that, you know, he had PTSD. He was a decorated Vietnam War veteran. He did two tours as a helicopter door gunman. So the things that he probably had to do for his time as a soldier and, and to protect our country is probably more than most people ever have to see. So anybody listening to this, I, I, I was able to patch things up with my father later in life. And uh, I don't have any hard feelings towards him. Well, tell us about, I mean, go back and tell us kind of what happened and I mean, how things were and then how things kind of turned bad. Sure. You know, when you're a young kid, you're oblivious to most things. And, and we lived in a very small town in North Mississippi. You know, my father's company was the largest employer, um, and he was a second over that entire operation. Uh, and, and with that, you know, he had certain financial benefits. And so in this small town, obviously, you know, we never wanted for anything, lived in a nice home in a very nice area on water. And But at some point, my parents split. My brothers, uh, at that time, I had two brothers. You know, we witnessed a, abuse, unfortunately. And uh, at some point, my mother made the decision to leave. And, you know, she did that at all costs. She didn't take much with her. We lived in a home that was uh, owned by a family friend on a farm. It was isolated and secluded and far from what we lived in. North Mississippi gets cold in the winters, and I specifically remember, you know, when that kerosene heater went out, it was cold. I remember the cold nights of not wanting to get out of bed, and I remember the, the days of not always having food. And my mother was a single mother and at that time uneducated, and she did what she uh, had to do working in a, in a normal minimum wage job to, to make ends meet. Well, and then take us kind of past your childhood years, kind of your high school, and then you decide you, you go to Florida State in law school. Kind of take us through how all that happened. Uh, you know, we moved around, um, you know, with my dad's job. I spent some time in Texas, and uh, he actually lived in Mexico for part of the time, and I, I spent a year out there. And 
and then kind of back and forth my mother eventually remarried and my stepfather worked in tuscaloosa for a year in the golf course industry and then ultimately settled in tallahassee florida so i finished high school there um, went to florida state and then uh got married and went to law school in mississippi well and, and tell us about you know going through florida state i mean was that that was all on you would you did you have to work you know through that time you know kind of tell us about that yeah yeah, I worked. My stepdad ran the golf course side of the country club, so I, I got the, the bad jobs. I had to mow the lake banks where the alligators and the, and the water moccasins hung around. But I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed being outside. I wasn't, you know, confined to a desk or an office setting at that time. But, you know, I learned work ethic, you know, that, and that's something that I can say about not only my father, but also my stepfather. You know, to this day, thinking back, never, ever, ever recall either one of those men taking a sick day. They had you know, just a Corinthian work ethic, and and I think that helped shape me. But so, you know, I worked through high school, worked through college. You know, I lived at home, and you know, that helped defray some of the costs. And by the time I went to law school, I'd gotten married, so my wife was working at the time, and that helped. And took off on our own and went to Mississippi. Why did you want to be a lawyer? You know, I, I really always wanted to from a young age. I, I don't really know why, honestly. I just did. Uh, you know, some people have these grandiose, uh, you know, uh, to kill a mockingbird, and, you know, ideas of, of what they're going to do and how they're going to, to help and what they think the profession is. I just always wanted to be one. And I had worked in the fitness industry and the hours were morning to night. And I know we work long hours as lawyers now, but it was just so unpredictable. And I was doing that out in Texas. So I decided that at that point I would move back finished up at Florida State, and then went to law school. Okay, well, and then after law school, you come to Mobile. You're not from Mobile. You'd never been to Mobile. Why Mobile? So here's what I was doing. I was clerking for a very uh, prominent, large plaintiff's firm in Mississippi, and uh, I had a friend that was that I knew from school there, and he was leaving probably, I would say, the most prominent criminal defense lawyer's office. He was graduating and, and taking the bar, and so I filled his slot as a clerk, and I had gone from, you know, reading FinFin documents and other civil drug cases to I went into this uh, law office and I got to work with Victor Carmody and he did DUIs and other various criminal defense cases and so I got to see you know just different things from anywhere from fights to DUIs to even shootings and and so I really liked the brevity of those cases how they could be taken care of in a matter of time and you actually did see the results of, of getting positive results from people so that's what I wanted to do and I decided that you know look most of these guys work solo they didn't hire people to work for them because when you go in and you pay that lawyer, you want that lawyer. So I started doing some research into the numbers of lawyers in areas that were near where we were from. I looked at some cities in North Carolina. I looked at Mobile. I looked at some cities in you know, Tennessee. And the numbers just made sense for Mobile. So you strike out into Mobile, you know, all completely new. So you get here. You know, you're a brand new lawyer. And I, and I can tell you, you know, as you know, I'm a lawyer, too. I went in with the big civil defense firm, you know, and so I, I didn't have the pressure of developing a practice. I, I, I had and I had people to teach me how to do things. You know, I, I had a nice three to five years of just learning how to be a lawyer and getting a nice paycheck. But you show up completely different. You show up. You got to start your law practice. How did you do it? Yeah. Well, at the time, my wife was a speech language pathologist, and we moved here literally almost two weeks to the day, I think, that Hurricane Katrina hit. So I'm, I've taken the bar. I'm wait, awaiting results, and Katrina hits. And so we're all digging all out of that, you know, in late August and early September, and then we get bar results in September. I pass. And as you said, I don't know a soul here. There's one guy here that I went to law school named Chris McGow who ends up being one of my best friends, but... I start practicing here, and I meet a guy in the, in the bicycle shop, and he went to Florida State. He was a real estate investor, so I did some of his you know, unlawful detainers and some of that low-level stuff, and I took court appointments from the judges, largely in district court, the youth center, to just kind of get my feet wet and learn. And so I, I did that for a little while. And I went to, you know, people from Mobile know Cowboy Bob Clark. They know Dennis Nisley. They know Jeff Dean. And I went to those guys and I said, look, how did you get to where you are? And they gave me some great advice, some <laughs> funny and colorful. And, you know, so that's, that's what I did. I just did what they told me to do to try to be who they were. 
And then at some point, you know, Chris McGow, who, who I'd mentioned, he, he and I formed a partnership and worked together for several years. And then he, he's, he's moved from Mobile since. And I stayed on my own. Right. And you've been on your own ever since. Yeah, I've been on my own. And, and, and as far as you were talking about, you know, building a practice, you know, so we moved to Mobile. Uh, I start practicing. And then about a year later, we, we have our, our first child, our daughter. And my wife takes maternity leave and we decide, look, you know, uh, we're going to try to make this work where she can stay with her as long as she can. And, and, you know, I remember distinctly the days coming home from the office and they don't have the lights on and the air conditioner on down here in Mobile, Alabama. And it's dark in the, in the house and it's warm. And it's because they're, she's trying to save money to, to make ends meet. Let's take a step back. Let's talk about your younger brother who passed away. Tell us about what happened and how that affected you. Uh, you, you know, if you're fortunate in life, you grow up and, and you don't start dealing with the loss of people until until you reach your, that age where your grandparents start passing. So, you know, you, normally you go through that. Well, my younger brother, who I'm 15 years older than him, uh, his name was Chris. He was diagnosed with cancer in 2009. And uh, it was a rare form of cancer, and he fought it, and he, he survived almost five years. It, it was in remission for some time, and uh, you know, he was the baby. You know, by this time, my mother who had remarried, and, and you know, my stepdad I had two brothers, so I've got four brothers at this point. And uh, you know, we had a very close knit family. And you know, he was diagnosed, and it was just when you learn, you know, when you hear that cancer word for somebody that's 16 at the time, it's just unimaginable. And I had lost a friend, you know, early on in the high school range to something similar, but it was I say friend, it was more of an acquaintance. But then, you know, that whole thing just shatters you. He beats it, and you have that relief, and, and everything's okay, and then you get the call that, that it's coming back. And you know exactly, I mean, you can remember where you're standing, not only when he's diagnosed with it, but when, he, when, it, when he's beaten it, and then when, he, when it returns. And ultimately, he passed in March of 2014. And, you know, to this day, it's, it's you know, largely splinters the family. You know, you're wondering the, the, the questions of why and how this could happen. and But you still have to kind of, get up and go to work and do what you've got to do to get over those days. Well, and also, I mean, there, there's a condition that you deal with. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't advertise it too much. Some of the people close to me know, but, you know, I'm an, an undiagnosed Asperger person. I, I, I'm on the spectrum. And, it, you know, it was something that was not known a lot about, and it's something that I don't, I don't like to talk about. Mine is more sensory issues, some social issues, but it, it really does – you know, affect day-to-day life. It's it's autism type, you know, spectrum based issues that I deal with. But I think a lot of those, uh, I try to make them positives. You know, it, it it forges a work ethic and an ability to focus. You know, and tune other things out that that may not be important or as I you know. But there's there si- other sides to it that cause you know what I call clutter and and can cause you know to a person to shut down. And it seems like you know maybe something's wrong, but it, it's just a a way to get by, so to speak. So, Jason, how has all that you've undergone in your life as a child going through the, you know, seeing your your parents split up, the poverty, taking everything on your own back, going through college and law school and starting your own firm and then the death of your brother and then your your Asperger's, you know, taking it all together, how has that shaped you? Rod, like, like I said in the beginning, you know, I really think that everything in your life is put there, you know, for you to learn, for you to for you to to grow and to develop you as a person and i i don't think you should change things in your life so i i other than the loss of my brother i i think everything is has been part of of who i am and it, it so i've used those things to try to grow to try to put one foot in front of the other and and try to accomplish you know what i can to to make the part of the world that i live in better um, to try to make it better for my family and, and you know, the things that you, you, you see as, as a child, you say, maybe I'll do that differently with my own kids. So you put that into practice and, you know, things that have happened in your life, you know, we, we talk about sometimes the, the, the same things that hold you back or the, the things that can make you great. And so we, we talk to our kids about that, like sometimes obstacles that can damage you. If you grow from them, if you learn from them, then, then they make you better. Right. And going through all this, you know, what have you learned about yourself? Well, I think, you know, what, what I have gone through is not unique to a lot of people. I mean, there's poverty all around us. And, and I was never, 
those are some of the happiest times of my life. I had, I had my brothers around me, you know, my family. I, but I, I've learned that like anybody, you know, the, a human being is resilient. You know, we have to go through certain things and, and, and just like, you know, seeing what you deal with, Rod, you know, like I tell people all the time, like I, mean, I get up and go to the gym every single morning that I can, because if Rod can get in there, then, then I've got no excuse. Well, you know, you miss Mondays a lot. I do, I do. I, a, a lot of weekends in the pool to, and on the bike make me tired, but that's uh, and I always hear from you. But it, it's about getting up and putting that foot in front of the other each day, every day. You know, it's been attributed to Yogi Berra and Wood, I think also Woody Allen that ninety percent of your success in life is just showing up. You know, being dependable, being there for for your clients or your your family and your friends. You just your existence of being in a spot where you're supposed to be and where people can count on you, uh, I think is what is taught by, you know, some of the things that anybody goes through. But certainly I feel I have learned that. Yeah. One of my former law partners said, you know, you got to dress out. Yeah. You, know, you got to <laughs> yeah. be there. Yeah. Then that's true. It's, it's, it's a lar- large part of it. Well, you, you know, we, uh, kind of piggybacking off of that, you know, we, we've talked in the past, you know, Jerry Seinfeld has this comedian's cars and coffee where these people are talking. He's talking with these famous comedians and uh, from movie stars down to just the stand up act. And, you know, they, they all have these unique stories and it's it's funny to see them go back and forth. But Trevor Noah, the, the South African uh, the host of The Daily Show right now, he has after he was telling Jerry like about how many shows he did every single night, every single day of the week. Jerry says, well, how, you know, why did, where did you learn that work ethic? And he said, from, from being poor. I mean, people do what they have to do to overcome where they are. Right. What's your philosophy on life? What do you think we're supposed to get out of life? I mean, do you ever just kind of sit back and reflect and think, okay, we're only here for a certain amount of time. I mean, what's it all about? Well, I really think it is about the impact that you can make on your small circle of people. You know, not everybody's a celebrity that's going to, you know, have millions of Facebook or Twitter followers that they can, you know, put out words to you know i we come across a you know eight or ten people that we're really close to a day and i think it's making their load easier you know my professional life is i see people at their worst i see where they've made mistakes or they've gotten involved in something they didn't understand and i see them just at the very lowest points and i I try to help them and and i know the perception of maybe what i do is that how what my clients actions may have harmed other people and that's a hard balance to strike but you you know there's there's fairness and there's a constitution in that regard and you know your your kids depend on you and the personal aspect of it your family depends on you and and you know you've got to take care of them so i think we're here just to help people stay on the path that they were meant to be on and and, and that's you know life is life can be tough on the good days and i think if you can say at the end of the day look you know i, I helped people today i think that's that's enormous right so, Jason, some people think that people in our profession, or most of them, come from these elite backgrounds. Based upon your background and on you know your childhood and what you've told us, I mean, do you think that makes you a better lawyer? Yeah, I, I think it does, Rod. You know, despite the issues that we, we've talked about with my father and, and any issues like that, I mean, I, I had the love and support of great parents great step parents but yeah i mean growing up like that you know when i went to law school and the teachers asked how many of your parents are lawyers i'd say 70 percent of the room the, the gymnasium or whatever you want to call it they, they the auditorium they, they raised their hands my, my parents weren't lawyers and and you know but it helps relate that i grew up in, an, in just a rural area to my clients and it helps relate i think it helps me do a better job and communicate with them and uh, understand maybe where they're coming from yeah, not that you were committed any crimes when you were younger, but but I guess being in that environment with some with some poverty and some tough times makes you maybe relate better to what your clients are going through. Right. Well, I mean, people make mistakes, and sometimes those mistakes put them in positions where they make poor decisions, and that's where your intent on a lot of these crimes come in. And, and people are nervous about going to see lawyers, especially people that, you know, maybe they, they come from a good friend, family, but they've made a mistake. And, you know, they they're, they're go meet with a lawyer, and they don't know if they're going to meet with some guy that's, you know, in a $2,500 suit and it can't relate to them at all and is going to is going to be throwing a bunch of legal lease around and, and they're lost. And so I think a lot of that is about putting them at ease and saying, look, you know, you're, you're going to be okay. We can get you through this. 
and kind of broaden this out, like what advice would you give, you know, to listeners who are struggling right now that are going through adversity, or just, you know, having some, just some bad luck? What advice would you give to them to try to try to get them out of it? Well, I, I would say reach out to uh, not only a person that they trust, but also a professional you know, a mental health professional, if someone's really struggling where you're, you know, you're down, talk to your friends, you know, because the chances are they've gone through it themselves, or maybe they're going through something similar. And it, it seems elementary, but I mean, we all have problems. And a lot of the times, especially when we're in the same homogenous area, we may suffer the same problems. You know, we may not all have money problems, we may not all have health problems, but voicing it helps, I think, a lot of times, but just having someone to relate to, when you're down. Right. Let's talk a little bit about your law practice now. Uh, tell us, you know, the, the name of the firm, what type of stuff you do, and, and how somebody can get in contact with you if they want to hire you. Well, um, going on 17 years now, this is the only kind of law that I've done, absent a few, you know, little real estate, you know, matters that I that I referenced earlier. But this is really all that I focus on. I can be reached at uh, darleylaw.com. I can be reached at 251-441-7772. But what I do, if someone is charged from from a a traffic ticket up to a capital offense, I I represent those people. I've benefited from being affiliated with Dennis Nisley, who I think most people regard as as one of the tops in our field. Uh, Like I said, I've sought counsel from from some lions of the bar, so to speak, and I've been very fortunate to work with with all of them. And... uh, that's my practice. I, I, if you're charged with something, give me a call. If I can't help you, I'll get to somebody that can. And you brought this up earlier that, you know, what you do, I mean, there, there's people out there in society, that you are on the news quite a bit representing some people that are some charged with, with crimes. And you probably hear this a lot that, man, what are you doing? You're just, you're trying to get these people that that murdered somebody, you know, off on a technicality. That's not great for society. I assume you hear that sometimes. I hear it. We hear that. We see the comments. We see the people outside the courthouse. And look, th- those things are largely largely made by, by people that don't understand how uh, the Constitution works, you know, they and how this, this justice system works. We have the best in the world, but it's flawed. People want to bang on the First Amendment and the Second Amendment and what that means and uh, all these constitutional, you know, principles. But the same thing that lets us run around with our guns down here are the ones that require a person where their government has come for them to to charge them with something. It requires a a fair defense. You know, we have multiple amendments, the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, and Eighth that require lawyers and jury trials and what that means. But we've got one for guns. And a, a lot of it is born from ignorance of people not understanding, but but I understand where they come from. I really do. Uh, but we just, like I said, we have our, our jobs to do, and, and ultimately people bark about that thing, but they don't hesitate to call us when their son or daughter or brother are in situations. We see it all the time, Rod. Well, Jason, I want to thank you so much for coming on. You know, the, you, know you hear that One thing you need to do is to make yourself a better person is is surround yourself by great people. And fortunately for me, I get to see you about every day when we work out together in the morning at about 5 a.m. every morning. And so, um, as you know, you and I talk about pretty deep stuff, and um, I'm, I'm glad we finally got you on the show. It's my honor to have you on and to be your friend. But... Having said that, so let's end the show with, I always give the guests the parting shot where give us some some great wisdom, some great advice that you hadn't given us yet. Give us something really good to take us all home. Okay. Rod, first of all, yeah, I, I appreciate your friendship, and, and I, I feel like I'm surrounded by people all the time that uh, that help me. Again, uh, it seems elementary, but I, you know, when you're going through something bad, reach out to a friend. When you're down, reach out to a friend. Try to do what you can do to get yourself by, and, and just a little bit of professional advice. If you ever commit a crime, don't take your cell phone with you. All right. Well, Jason, it's been a pleasure having you, and um, I'll talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Love the episode with Jason Darley. He's got a great, successful criminal law practice, but he's made it through a lot of obstacles to get there. He shares great advice and shares great life lessons. Join us next week for another great guest and another 30 minutes of inspiration from Rocket Motivation Podcast. See you next week.
So thanks again for listening to Rocket Motivation. I want to again thank our sponsor, Christy McCullough, and her firm, Empowered Family Law. Listeners in the Mobile County, Alabama area, get in touch with Chrissy and Empowered Family Law for all your family law issues and needs. If you would like to get my book, Get Back Up, it's available at Amazon. Just put in Get Back Up and my name, Rod Cade, and the book will pop up. I'd appreciate it if you would subscribe to Rocket Motivation wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please rate and review the shows and spread the word about Rocket Motivation to your friends. So until next time, remember, never give up and always get back up.